Marshal Kapoor and uh, Jim Diljeet Singh, the distinguished uh, panelist, ladies and gentlemen. So I welcome back everyone to the first session of the day that is on COVID-19 and novel initiatives. And I'll just take a moment to introduce uh, the chair for the session and the keynote speaker. So the, for chairing this session, we have with us a Marshal Pavan Kapoor, Ati Vishesh Seva Middle, Vishesh Seva Middle and Bar, former DGMS Air, the Masters in uh, Hospital Administration from Ames, and uh, a DNB and a uh, DHHM uh, degree, also a host of management degrees, MMS and an MBA, as also an MPhil in Defense and Strategic Study, uh, Strategic Management, and he was professor and head, head of the department of Hospital Administration and Medical Informatics at AFMC Pune. He has commanded a multi-speciality military hospital and has held important appointments at the AMC Center and College, as also officers training college, and in the office of DGAFMS. He has been a Brig Medical of a Corps, as also in the office of the DGMS Army. And he was the DGMS Air before retiring in 2017. He has attended the National Defense College. And what's more, that he was awarded the coveted Yaralal Gold Medal, which is given for the best dissertation there. Uh, it's indeed, indeed a very uh, rare achievement. Uh, Jim Daljeet Singh, Vishesh Seva Medal, presently the DGMS Army, holds a postgraduate degree in pediatrics, uh, a DNB and DM, and he's a patient-oriented neonatologist uh, with a broad range of experience in providing care to critical infants with congenital abnormalities and complex heart diseases. He has published many articles in international and national journals and is a member of many scientific societies. He has trained and taught both undergraduates and postgraduate medical students in pediatrics. And he is a certified national trainee for neonatal resuscitation program. Uh, with these words of introduction, I hand over for conduct of the session to the chair. Over to you, sir. Thank you, General Sunil. Thank you, General Ravi. And thank you, the organizers, and thank you, St. Charles, for giving us this privilege and opportunity once again to be present in front of all of our uh, brother, colleagues, peers, and all the participants who have come here to join uh, this uh, unique session on COVID-19 and the novel initiative that we have taken. Well, uh, you know, good morning to all of you. Good morning, my dear panelists, and good morning to all the participants. Before I begin, you know, COVID-19, of course, is called COVID-19 as a disease, but now it become COVID-19. What started in 19 has become COVID-20 and COVID-21. So we do not know exactly how else, where should we take it, but let's remember the disease from here that is started. And what began as isolated cases of pneumonias of unknown etiology in Wuhan, in the Hawaii, province of China soon became a pandemic of unprecedented proportions. And we all have lived through the pandemic. Pandemic posed several challenges in various sectors, in various fields. What we know that this disease caused by the beta strain of SARS coronavirus 2, which was originally called the novel coronavirus, and therefore it is slightly sardonical and satirical that today we are going to discuss the novel initiatives against the novel coronavirus. And we should discuss those novel initiatives because this virus created havoc. It created havoc across the nation states. It did not respect the national or the international boundaries. It did not respect your gender. It did not respect what facilities you had. The best of nations infrastructure collapse. The nations which had the best possible Healthcare facilities, their healthcare infrastructure collapsed. So it did not spare anybody. 
what your economic status was, what you were ultimately you were a victim of SARS coronavirus too. This pandemic posed challenges, but this pandemic and this virus never understood that the will and the skill of man, mankind, of human beings, is probably far stronger. And this strength comes from the fact that we are used to taking measures, we are used to taking initiatives to combat any challenges that is posed in front of the healthcare services, whether it be the civil healthcare services or it be the armed forces medical services. So needless to say that although this virus till date has affected almost 243 million people across the globe with almost around 4.95 million deaths, USA continues to lead with 46 million cases and 751,000 deaths, whereas India is closely second with 34 million cases and 453,000 deaths, with Brazil coming a bit third with much higher number of deaths as compared to India. But when you compare cases per million, still India was better off. We may call it by whatever means we are better off, whether our reporting was inadequate, whether our inbuilt immunity was adequate, we still cannot close this debate. So let's not close the debate. Let's continue with the debate and move forward at how this virus spread in waves across several nation states and wreaked havoc. It changed many things. It changed the way we think. It changed the lifestyle. It changed the manner in which a pandemic is to be combated. But what it could not change was the human spirit and the willingness to fight against all odds. And fight we did. All of us fought at every level. Although we know that no nation was spared, even the best equipped with the excellent healthcare infrastructure was overwhelmed. We too were overwhelmed by the second wave. But the spirit to accept and overcome the challenges, that could not be overwhelmed. The virus made every member of this global community think and take newer initiatives, not only to fight and survive the virus, but also learn to cope with the restrictions and the repeated lockdowns and job losses that have occurred as a consequence of combating this pandemic. Yes, we did take preventive me measures and we did realize that it is good to learn from past. We did learn from past what we had forgotten, the hand hygiene, the respiratory etiquettes, the cleaning and disinfection measures that we are supposed to take, all these came to the fore. So the three W's, wash your hands, wear your mask, and watch your distance, it became, they became the buzzwords. Infection control practices, managing the airflow system, the air conditioning and the heating, ventilation and air conditioning systems, having negative pressure isolation rooms for carrying out aerosol generating procedures, all these things became routine in healthcare settings. Not that they did not exist, they did exist, but their importance came into fore. And people came forward with newer and newer in initiative, how to create this negative pressure ventilations in these rooms. Everybody came, the scientific community got their hands together and they all worked together at a very rapid pace. So quickly the diagnostic test in terms of the rapid antigen test, the RT-PCR test, they came into being Sooner, sooner later we found that even CT scan can be used for assessing whether you are suffering from the respiratory impacts of the SARS coronavirus 2 or for understanding the severity of the disease for initiating more rigorous treatment. They all continue to be rolled out at a very regular interval. Yes, there were trial and errors. Every novel initiative has to have trial and error. So there were trial and errors. And what could be the initiative? You started with the hydroxychloroquine. We went on to several antiviral combinations, lopinavir, ritonavir, remdesivir, name it. All the weeds came forward. anti drugs were utilized. Plasma therapy was uh, investigated. Monoclonal antibodies came to the fore. The concept of ventilation changed. The concept of providing ventilatory support changed. Oxygen conservation became 
the hallmark of disease how to reduce the oxygen consumption of a patient because oxygen became in short supply the use of telemedicine which was a concept only for a few became a routine affair physical contacts reduced the virtual contacts got announced the national digital health mission and telemedicine guidelines that were in embryonic stage they got a boost and they were delivered at a very short notice you know we all use the concept of tribes so fondly in the armed forces especially in armed forces medical services as a means of evacuating casualties handling casualties in the combat zone also this word has been used in the emergency department this word has been used for handling mass casualty incidences but this concept of tribe now came in being utilized for segregating the respiratory illnesses vis a vis the other illnesses so see how people use the existing terminology into to force fit into the existing situation that we faced hospital and intensive care unit beds were created overnight in the country the railway coaches railways coaches they got converted into hospital beds with critical care facilities armed forces and drdo joined hands to promptly come up with the hospital equipped with critical care facilities within a very short duration of time to top it all a plethora of vaccines were produced some indigenously in india like the co vaccine and some in collaboration like the covid shield and all this happened within a very short span of time india became the first country a few days ago to have administered 100 crore doses to its population and the honorable prime minister was just addressed the state, nation at 10 am today to celebrate this achievement so with all these efforts i think and again i say i think we are probably beginning to see some light at the end of the tunnel now we do not know exactly what the future is going to unfold for us but we also know that what were the variants what were happens to the virus we will continue to develop novel in novel initiatives to take care and face any challenge that any of these variants of interest or variants of concern that could affect us in the future well i shall sum up by saying that so far we seem to have prevailed we seem to have prevailed and this has been largely due to the efforts of the scientific community the healthcare professionals the frontline workers and the administration who have worked together tirelessly without any concern for their safety or for their, the safety of their near and dear ones we lost people we lost doctors we lost nurses we lost healthcare professionals we lost lot of front we lost lot of frontline workers we lost lot of people from the administration but we did not lose our spirit and we continue to develop newer and newer ways and means of combating this virus the armed forces medical services have been a glittering example of taking up the challenges posed by this virus and have provided the requisite leadership in reaching out in very novel ways to abate to mitigate and to lessen the effects of this pandemic so i salute the armed forces medical services for all the efforts that they have taken to combat this pandemic and to serve the nation in the time of its need i thank the organizers and the center for joint warfare studies for giving me this privilege of clearing of uh, chairing this uh, very unique session on covid-19 and novel initiatives i will now not stand between you and the galaxy of eminent speakers that we have in this session who are not only truly true professionals but they are also truly passionate about their profession it is my privilege now to invite general daljeet singh bsm and djms army to deliver the keynote address i have known general daljeet for a very long time and as i said as i said earlier he was all in the blues and he ultimately came to the last rank and now in the olive greens i was always in the ogs but in my last rank i came in the blues it doesn't matter in which rank you are in which appointment you are but what is important is the general daljeet as a human being is probably not only you know we all know him as a thorough professional 
a perfect pediatrician and a, and a very, very endearing neonatologist. But more than all this, he's also an excellent human being with an unwavering commitment to his profession in the armed forces. So, General Jaljit, I request you to deliver your keynote address on the subject of COVID-19 and the novel initiatives. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. Jain. Thank you, sir. Thank you for those very kind words. Air Marshal Pawan Kapoor was my DGMS Air, my friend, philosopher, and guide for not only for me, he has been a friend, philosopher, and guide for a generation and the generation which was there and generation which preceded this present generation of armed forces, medical officers, and seniors. He remains a beacon and a guiding light for all of us. Thank you very much, sir. I also thank General Srivastava and General Ravi Aroda. As uh, General Ravi Aroda, sir, I have had very few interactions with you over the last uh, few days uh, over WhatsApp and have seen you on in the, your photograph and you are just staying in the video conference today. But I must tell you, sir, you are a unique picture of humility and grandeur, and I salute you, sir. Uh, I will, uh, I'm going to share my slides when I talk, but as, the, as it opens up, uh, the uh, uh, slide and also before I start, I must also tell you uh, I'm happy to have Colonel Th uh, Group Captain Tilak with me in this uh, same session. Group Captain Tilak has been the physician for Sardar Vallabhai Patel Hospital, uh, uh, the DRD hospital which the armed forces were providing medical cover at and managing the uh, uh, COVID, casual COVID uh, casualties there. And he both the years. Uh, first wave as well as second wave. He did a very excellent work in that. Uh, in that, but he is one of the very most sought after physicians. You know, he has done his uh, MBBS and post graduation in uh, medicine from Armed Forces Medical College. He had done his medical oncology from Orange Institute of Medical Sciences. Won a lot of awards and medals, both as an undergraduate as well as a post graduate. You know, he is a. Uh, Fellow of, it's very not easy to become a fellow of Indian Medical Sciences Academy and Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons at Glasgow. You know, he has several publications which he has published, but more than all this, you know, he has what we call to be a compassionate physician who looks after his patients with concern, empathy, and respect. This is the hallmark of. This officer, my introduction to you. Uh, I request uh, Rip Captain Tilak, uh, please take over the stage and share your experiences of the initiatives taken by the Armed Forces and Medical Services during this coronavirus. I know you have been at the helm of affairs, so share those experiences and let us know what initiatives were taken by the Armed Forces to combat this novel coronavirus. Thank you. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh I'm humbled by the kind words from you. Um, I'm honored to be on the uh, panel with you as the chairperson. Uh, my uh, deep sense of gratitude uh, to General Srivastav and General Arora, the organizers of this event. Um, my respects to uh, General Daljit Singh, BSM, BJMS Army, and of course, uh, you, sir, for uh, giving me an opportunity to, to share my experience of. Uh, the novel initiatives taken by uh, the Indian Armed Forces during the COVID-19 pandemic. Are my slides visible, sir? Slides are visible. If you can put them on the slideshow, they are visible. You are audible and visible. Thank you very much, sir. Um, the initiatives taken by the Armed Forces uh, over the next 20 minutes or so, I shall be talking about these. Uh, in as succinct manner as possible, though it is difficult to concise the uh, entire uh, initiatives in 20 minutes or so, I think I'll make my best of my efforts. 2019 December, the COVID-19 virus from Wuhan spreads like wildfire over the entire world, causing unprecedented travel restrictions, which probably the world had not witnessed uh, for many a decades. The countries had their own policies of restricting movement. Part of the countries initially, majority of them having almost total restrictions. But over a period of time, for a few weeks to months, the whole world was caught in the grip of the pandemic. 
these scenes of the airlines parking all their aircrafts, having absolutely any space available for any more parking in the airports, was not seen by many of us. And the Indian Armed Forces were also involved in the entire thing. We were not aware. We were also hit in the same manner. Our people who were at different places were stuck. People who had traveled on duty, on leave, were not able to come back. Those who had traveled back had to have specific uh, recommendations for regarding their joining the unit, their quarantine policies. Were we prepared for all this? Were we able to reach up to the expectations we have needed to keep the disease under control? Not behind this is the, the medical services, which was nearly overwhelmed with the kind of response to be taken right from the testing to the uh, policies for the isolation, for the quarantine, etc. The hospital beds were filling up gradually and eventually most of the beds were full. We had to grapple with the requirement of equipments, the drugs, the ventilators, uh, the hectic procurement from all sides, so much so that the uh, forces, along with the other uh, agencies of this country, had set up makeshift hospitals to tackle this emergencies. What we actually saw during this probably is what is the the figure of the, the COVID-19. What we see in you know the severe cases and the deaths are just the tip of the iceberg. Many of the challenges are probably not brought forward. They are the actual chunk of the the iceberg which forms uh, in this. Uh, while tackling this pandemic. The armed forces played a very major role as an overall. Uh, as a first responder, as regards the medical services, the armed forces medical service and its role, uh, the training, upscaling both the equipment as well as the uh, infrastructure, the military preparedness towards this pandemic, and of course, the vaccination drive. Over the next few minutes, I'd like to cover a few of these in detail to see what has been the initiatives by the armed forces. When the call of the nation came, the armed forces were the first responders when it came to quarantine and isolation centers and attending to the international evacuees. These quarantine centers were set up majorly at Manesar and at Jaisalmer. However, there were many, many other more centers which were set up or kept ready for these people. These centers geared up in a record time to set up the beds with oxygen facilities, testing, contact tracing, etc., and maintain the isolation of these patients who turned positive. Like the previous uh, uh, the chairperson had mentioned, the railway coaches were invoked into uh, COVID care centers, both as quarantine and isolation facilities, which is manned by the armed forces medical services. In addition to these, the advisories which came out uh, from the office of the DGFMS uh, was to maintain readiness for holding more and more people at various places for quarantine and isolation. Additional beds, additional equipments and drugs were catered for these places to maintain these uh, centers. Eventually, the time came to uh, raise the level to call our own people back into the country with the, all the borders shutting down. Uh, the Indian Air Force uh, rose up to this location. The C-17 team was ready with its uh, fleet of aircrafts to gear up for the requirement of bringing in the international travelers back to the country. They traveled to China as well as to other countries over the world, in the Middle East, etc., to bring back people into this country, taking care at each point of uh, making sure that they're not able, not taking people who are positive or are likely to be positive, uh, checking them at the uh, entry points and uh, making them board the aircraft. They not only brought back the uh, people from various countries, they also took care of the supplies to the various uh, countries, including China, um, the drugs, the uh, equipments, the personal protective equipments, masks, disinfectants, sanitizers, etc., were supplied to these uh, countries. Oxygen shortage, as was mentioned by the chairperson, was indeed an issue. Uh, the Air Force rose up to the occasion, and again, the oxygen tanks, the oxygen generation systems, they were transported from world over. Uh, carrying filled oxygen is an issue in the aircrafts, and hence the Indian Navy came into uh, its role. Uh, empty cylinders used to travel out of this country, and filled cylinders used to come back by sea 
uh, to maintain the supply chain. The challenge which was seen by this was also taken on by the helicopters, uh, by the Chinooks, by the Mi-17s, in raising to, uh, to, the, uh, to the occasion of uh, providing these oxygen tanks and uh, systems to faraway locations uh, at various places. But the most challenging among all these things was an unprecedented way of flying the aircrafts by this air crew. It was not uh, common to see them fly with uh, the full complement of PPE. You can imagine the difficulty of flying an aircraft and doing that with a complete PPE and having a crew management in place was indeed a challenge, uh, which was taken up very rightly and uh, mightily by these uh, air warriors. Coming to the Armed Forces Medical Services as regards the training aspect of it, the Information, Education and Communication, we call it the IEC. The policies for screening of people at various time points as the disease evolved was an important aspect. Screening, contact tracing and quarantining and isolation became an important uh, aspect in the medical services. Positive patients, they had to meet quarantine centers, uh, isolation centers. Uh, eventually, when the hospitals and wards started filling up, having the uh, requirements of the feasibility of home isolation uh, was taken up. There were policies issued. Testing policies, when should we test at the beginning? When do we test at the end of an infection? These are modified throughout the last one and a half years uh, to make it as feasible as possible for the population. The treatment protocols, which were devised right from the Office of BGFMS and also from the Armed Forces Medical College, uh, the entire Pune complex uh, got together in making the protocols uh, which were feasible, which were easily uh, passed on to the uh, other units for following it up. The advisories of uh, COVID care, both in terms of personal protection, the uh, wearing of the personal protection equipment, uh, safety, uh, the screening, quarantine and isolation were issued on a very, very uh, speedy basis at uh, various time points to the formation headquarters, which then disseminated it down the uh, units for them to follow. The training of the uh, medical officers, the nursing officers and the paramedical staff, while they were deployed at various COVID hospitals was an important task. Uh, the faculty uh, at, uh, involved in this training took active part in training the uh, medical officers who came across disciplines uh, to take care of the COVID-19 patients. Uh, the WHO came across uh, as a helping hand in imparting knowledge uh, and training uh, regarding this uh, at these centers. Uh, this is the view from the, uh, the hotel at the New Delhi when we were geared up for the Sadar Vallabhai Patel COVID hospital at uh, Delhi. Uh, practical demonstrations of using the personal protective equipment in the right manner so as to reduce personal infection as well as transmitting infections while donning and doffing uh, was taken into account and was carried out before these people were deployed on active COVID duties. The weakest chain in the link is the housekeeping staff, uh, an endeavor by the training personnel to look after their training of and handling of the COVID-19 waste. Their handling of the personal protective equipment was diligently taken up uh, because they would have been the people who were spreading the maximum if they were not aware how to, how to handle the COVID-19 waste both at the uh, various COVID hospitals set up by DRDO and manned by the Armed Forces Medical Services. These are the views from the Delhi and the Patna hospitals. Active uh, role was taken up by the faculty there to uh, train the housekeeping staff uh, in looking after prevention of COVID-19 exposure. The Armed Forces generally also acts at a fulcrum at various other levels. For the testing, the Armed Forces Medical College became a nodal center uh, for uh, approving other uh, centers for testing by RT-PCR. Uh, it helped in establishing numerous centers in Maharashtra uh, for RT-PCR testing. The continuing medical educations, uh, education programs, which are organized at the national level, uh, as well as the Armed Forces Medical College took up the master class in COVID-19 in imparting education to uh, various doctors, nurses, and uh, paramedical staff about uh, COVID-19. Uh, we played as a major role in, uh, in during the pandemic. The national and the state level task forces on COVID-19, which are formed, 
the office of the DGFMS and the DCIDS played an important role in contributing to these task forces. Uh, at this college, uh, AFMC was an integral member of the Maharashtra Task Force on COVID-19, uh, contributing actively with nearly daily webinars over the last uh, one and a half years. Uh, the inputs from this college were actively taken up by the uh, Director of Medical Education at, uh, uh, and Research at Maharashtra uh, State Health Services and were implemented across various centers. Regarding the military preparedness and uh, the uh, upgradation of the hospitals to COVID uh, capabilities, the COVID hospitals were uh, of various types. They were hospitals which continued with the normal working with an area designated and delineated for COVID care. Nearly all armed forces medical hospitals uh, were involved in this kind of a care. There were a few hospitals which were for only COVID patients. For example, the base hospital Delhi Cant was completely isolated only for COVID patients. The routine care which the hospital provides was shifted to other hospitals. And this hospital became a standalone COVID care, dedicated COVID care hospital. We did not fall short. We went on to care, give, provide care to the civilian patients. When called upon, the hospitals were delineated for uh, civilian care. The command hospital Puna looked after civilians as well as serving personnel. And eventually, the military hospital, Cardiac Thoracic Center at Pune, or the uh, uh, Army Institute of Cardiac Thoracic Sciences, later as it was rechristened, took care of all the civilian uh, COVID patients, having nearly 400 beds for them with nearly 100% occupancy in both the ways. The COVID care at various armed forces health centers can be broadly looked into as a primary health care facilities, that is at the station level and unit levels. At the secondary health care hospitals, where there, there, are, there is feasibility or availability of primary specialties, uh, basic specialties, medical, surgical, anesthesia, radio diagnosis, uh, but may not have the tertiary care facilities. And of course, how the tertiary care hospitals, they geared up to providing COVID care all coming together to provide a comprehensive COVID care um, to our patients, uh, both serving veterans, families, as well as the civilians. Coming to an example of each of these, at the primary care level, the Air Station Jalali, it uh, uh, rose up to the occasion. It established the uh, quarantine and isolation facilities. The patients of category uh, of moderate and severe were shifted to Command Hospital Air Force Bangalore. Uh, which admitted these patients, whereas mild cases were managed at Air Force Station Jalali. Um, in the second wave also, they had a very active part, and uh, they also took care of the home-based telemonitoring when the home isolation facilities came in, and of course the vaccination drive. They upgraded their available buildings uh, with the beds and the equipments needed to manage uh, mild cases and to keep the quarantine people. Uh, they had the requisite uh, procurements for the personal protective equipments, oxygen delivery, and the ambulances to shift patients when required. Coming to the secondary care level in the Navy, the Indian Naval uh, Hospital Ship Dhanvantri at Port Blair uh, rose up again in a, in a fantastic manner to provide care in an island to the COVID patients. Um, they took up the uh, special services of the Defense Works, the Section 35, and uh, uh, created their own uh, special works to create uh, COVID wards, a special isolation ward with separate wards for VIP officers. JCU was, was created. They had a COVID OT and a COVID labor room because with no options to transfer patients anywhere else, which were totally self-sufficient. They converted a, a veranda by using the powers of the defense works in during emergency to create a special ward with an integrated medical gas pipeline system. Uh, this helped them a lot in managing the cases uh, as the cases rose during the Second wave. Uh, this shows how the uh, the commanders at various levels have facilitated these things to happen um, in an isolated place uh, for the medical services to provide the requisite medical care to the patients. At the tertiary care level, we have the hallmark of the base hospital Delhi Cant, which was a dedicated COVID hospital with over 800 uh, beds given purely towards COVID care. Over the last two uh, waves, they have treated more, more than 11,000 patients. They did have their uh, despite the number of beds, they had uh, shortage. They had to do makeshift uh, changes by using the special powers of emergency defense works. The housekeeping staff were always at a shortage. Crowd management and counseling 
was also an issue uh, which was with while handling so many patients, the relatives, etc., to which the other arms and services came in and uh, helped the hospital provide the best care possible for COVID patients at a single place. The Armed Forces Medical Services also had uh, aid to civil authorities. Um, they provided care to the uh, DRDO established hospitals. The first of his hospitals was at the Sardar Vallabhai Patel COVID Hospital at Delhi, which was a thousand bedded hangar based hospital set up in a record period of 12 days, completely from a, a barren ground to a fully elevated structure. Uh, we were involved in taking care of these patients for a good about six months, six, eight months before it was temporarily wound up. Uh, the facilities, the provision of the pharmacy, the biomedical waste management, the housekeeping staff, uh, the laboratory services. It was an excellent exposure for all of us who were involved in setting up these uh, services at this hospital. The successful uh, venture at the COVID hospital Delhi finally led the government to start uh, PMKS COVID hospitals at Patna, uh, where again we were involved in setting up the medical services, whereas DRDO set up the uh, hospital. Here, the uh, a separate medical college and hospital building was converted into a standalone COVID hospital. So that gave us a different infrastructure to function as compared to the hunger based hospital. A third hospital was brought up at Mujafarpur in uh, again in Bihar. This was a replica of the uh, COVID hospital at Delhi, a 500 bedded hangar based facility, again with the full complement of pharmacy, biomedical waste management, housekeeping stuff, laundry, uh, catering, etc. During the second wave, these hospitals got activated in a very short period of time. And in addition, seeing the experience from the previous wave, new hospitals were added at Ahmedabad, also at the Atal Bihari Vajpayee COVID Hospital at Lucknow, and the uh, Pandit Ranjan Mishra COVID Hospital at Varanasi. So the Armed Forces Medical Services, the Army, Navy, Air Force, doctors, and the paramedical staff, the nursing officers, they were deployed at all these hospitals uh, to look after the uh, patients in the structure which is provided by the DRDO. Um, and it's a, it's a mammoth task to manage the movements, the provision of uh, the requisite needs for these people to can do their task. And uh, it was very well done. What are the challenges we had at these COVID hospitals? It was an example how to collaborate with the government agencies and private stakeholders when the need arises. The reason for the thousand bedded hospital was entirely different to probably prepare for a uh, kind of a war preparedness. But in the times of COVID, it turned out to be a boon. We were able to collaborate with uh, another government agency like DRDO. We had private stakeholders who were providing the pharmacy laboratory services. The infrastructure was entirely different. None of us from the Armed Forces Medical Services had ever worked in that kind of a atmosphere, uh, working in hangars, uh, working with uh, private uh, pharmacy agencies, the laboratory services, uh, taking care of the biomedical waste management, the uh, IEC practices to prevent vector borne diseases in those hangar areas. Uh, a big salute to our community medicine people who came in with all their experience to tackle these challenges. We had our shortcomings and which we tried to come over. Uh, we tried to improve our workplace ergonomics by uh, trying to make the best of whatever is available within that structure to provide uh, care for the caregivers. To integrate our kind of protocols and SOPs within the army unit is very easy. To do it with the civilians, it takes another challenge to explain to them that why we need a particular process in this manner. And it was a learning experience. And with this, what we learned is that it can be done. We can collaborate with other agencies uh, to the best of our uh, outcomes. The armed forces never fell, fell back. Uh, it moved ahead with the upscaling of the uh, Require, require uh, for the equipment and the drugs, etc. The emergency powers of the DFPDS were invoked, which were a uh, huge sum of amount and really unlimited. During the first wave, close to 30 to 50 crores of uh, personal protective equipment, masks, ventilators, etc., were procured with very fast process. And uh, during the second wave, by this time, the procurement process had eased out. So most of the units were able to stock up on the requirements of the PPs and masks. But this time we had the difficulty of tackling the oxygen shortage in drugs. Uh, spending about 50 to 55 crores, about 20 oxygen generation plants were procured and installed at various places. 33 mobile oxygen generation systems 
were put in place at various uh, armed forces services and medical services institutes for uh, getting up the uh, requirement of the oxygen. There was a strategical change also during the first wave. The delegation of powers was given to the formation headquarters to manage with whatever funds they had uh, by invoking the special emergency powers of procurement. However, during the second wave, realizing that the uh, formations need funds in, in addition to the powers, there was a financial allotment also, which helped a lot in the procurement at the uh, downstream level. The armed forces was at the forefront when it came to the vaccination drive. Uh, all the health frontline workers, uh, the healthcare workers, the medical nursing students, the cadets, the officers and uh, men of the other arms and services, and also the dependents, the vaccination drive was in full swing. Uh, completed a record time of 1.5 million people vaccination. And of course, the centers opened up as vaccination centers for the civilians, civilians as well. The AFMS was not behind when it came to research and innovation. Uh, they not only had the ideas, they were able to execute these ideas by collaborating with other scientific institutes uh, to bring out the products. A couple of products, the Navraksha personal protective equipment has been in the top for a very long time. It is one of the uh, very uh, fantastic in uh, innovations which have been used by us during these uh, deployments at these various COVID hospitals across these five to seven COVID hospitals. This is a, a simple to make, with uh, very easy to wear, breathable PP, uh, with a very excellent protection. And we are proud to say that our very, very minuscule people from our armed forces medical services actually got uh, COVID-19 during their active duty in these uh, COVID hospitals. So this has been widely subscribed to. To reduce the exposure during uh, caring of a patient, uh, there was always the idea of having a retractable canopy. Uh, so this was the innovation of the Raksha Kavach by uh, the team from uh, the anesthesia department of the Armed Forces Medical College along with other engineering institutes. They brought out this special retractable canopy, uh, which also has filters, a two-level kind of a, uh, a chain to prevent the uh, spread of the virus while handling COVID-19 patients. When it came to research papers, the Armed Forces Medical Services was the first institute, one of the first institutes to pro provide a producer mathematical modeling uh, using the SEER model, that is the susceptible exposed infectious and recovered model to see what would be the effect of the lockdown. This paper had 148 citations and they had uh, expected that with the lockdown, the deaths would be very, very minimal. They were not, uh, they were close to the target what they had predicted uh, thanks to the lockdown and proving that by that the lockdown indeed is effective. The win-win cohort study, one of its kind, the largest vaccination study with having 1.59 million uh, people as subjects uh, has been a, a hallmark study in the vaccination drive, proving thereby that vaccination does save lives. It does prevent severe disease and deaths. Uh, this kind of a uh, study population is, uh, is respected world over uh, in these kind of studies. As regards the perspective endeavors of the armed forces, uh, we, they are, the medical professionals also had an extension to the short service commission, which was offered uh, a year of extension to provide their services if they wish to. The deferment was taken up for the people with uh, premature retirement from service. Uh, contractual uh, staff of doctors was also taken up. Uh, people who had just retired had taken up on contractual basis to work for COVID-19 at various establishments. Uh, the keynote address at the inaugural session, we saw uh, General Karitkar talk about the Sehat portal for telemedicine, uh, supporting the armed forces personnel and their families. Uh, I personally have been involved in the using of this particular portal, both as a service provider as well as uh, uh, reaching out for uh, help during the second wave. Uh, it was very, very heartening to see the response on the Sehat portal. Uh, which is easy to register and to uh, get an appointment. Uh, it does allay a lot of uh, anxiety and uh, pressures while being in difficult times. To sum up of what all the armed forces has done to, uh, as initiatives for the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, the multifaceted initiatives which have started at various levels, at the headquarters, at the formation levels, at the unit levels, at various armed services levels, 
based on the robust structure and integration of the services which can be provided uh, on the basis of which these initiatives were taken out, eventually gave tangible and effective sequels which were visible uh, for the entire country uh, to see and how we could uh, evolve over the last one and a half years to tackle this pandemic. And finally, like our chairperson has said, maybe, maybe we have reached a, uh, uh, you know, we have successfully come over, overcome the, uh, the effect of this pandemic. But come what may, if this does have, take a different turn, we will stand up to the, uh, the challenge once again. This, I'll stop my, my sharing and hand over the proceedings back to the chairperson. Thank you, Captain Tilak, for a very, very extensive presentation, which was very lucid. And uh, we all could see that yes, the Armed Forces Medical Services took up initiatives at the infrastructural level, at the process level, at the education, training, communication level, as well as in support of the civil population and the civil organization. A very, very well covered subject in a very lucid manner. Thank you very much for this. We'll keep the question towards the end. If audience wants to, uh, participants want to ask any question, please put it in the question answer box or else, uh, you know, you can uh, just put something in the chat box. So I would now take this opportunity to invite Mr. Dilip Patil. Mr. Dilip Patil is the founder director of Trivector Group. You know, generally he is going to talk to us on airborne infection control in closed indoor spaces. New solution to go back to normal. And Trivector Biomed, you know, it is a company which has been leading, uh, the leading company in IVF infection control since almost last, uh, I can say more than two and a half decades. He, Mr. Patil is a biomedical engineer. And I always call a biomedical engineer is one where marriage takes place between the medical and the engineering sciences. So Mr. Dilip Patil is uh, the product of that marriage and he specialized in airborne infection control. Trivector, uh, for all of your information, they are now the first India's cold plasma based air disinfection device, which was actually effective to kill airborne COVID-19, tuberculosis, all these type of airborne infections. So I will not stand between you and Mr. Dilip Patil. Mr. Dilip Patil, the stage is all yours, and I will request to you to keep within the limit of 20 minutes so that we don't run short of time. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for a nice introduction. And it is my uh, proud privilege to be part of uh, such a august uh, panelist and, uh, in fact, uh, over serving nation. It's, uh, we always feel proud to share ties or share some interaction with the uh, armed force uh, people. And I've been fortunate uh, to be the first one. Our company was uh, the first one to set up uh, infertility center in armed forces, the first infertility center to start with in APMC and then to RNR uh, hospital uh, under the initiative of uh, Major General Arora, Punita Arora. So our association goes back to those dates uh, in 2000. And uh, we're still serving uh, armed forces with our airborne infection control solutions. So today I'm going to talk about this novel uh, infection control solution, especially airborne infection control solution, because there have been uh, various solutions uh, in use and many companies and many products, uh, many technologies have sprung up, sprung up uh, during the COVID times. So what is the difference? Or what is the new technology? So I, I'll be sharing uh, my uh, presentation with you. Uh, just let me know whether uh, we are able to see that. Yeah, we can see your presentation. Okay. So, of course, my uh, topic is getting back to work safely and happily forever. So, what is a sustainable solution for indoor uh, airborne infections, uh, right, indoor air quality? And so, let's talk about because, uh, as you said, sir. Uh, Maybe we are seeing the end of the tunnel, but uh, you never know, we may face another tunnel. Uh, so we have to keep our headlights on. So that is what uh, my presentation is going to focus on. So about Trivector, you just mentioned, uh, this company was founded in 1993 uh, by me and my wife. Uh, uh, 
uh, we are headquartered in Mumbai and have presence all over India. So we normally started with IVF uh, lab setup because that time IVF was in its infancy uh, and then uh, we actually did hand holding to all these IVF specialists, uh, gave them training. Uh, uh, we set up their lab on turnkey basis. Uh, and then we also uh, ventured to animal biotechnology for the same uh, reproductive this thing. And then in 2016, we uh, launched a vertical for uh, hospital infection control, and we launched this uh, air disinfection products in India in 2016. So uh, we are uh, partnering with an uh, Irish company called Novirus. Uh, they have this uh, special uh, uh, disinfection devices. So uh, during COVID times, uh, as a CSR activity, we have installed many. Uh, uh, this airborne infection control devices in different uh, government hospitals. And we installed uh, uh, quite a few uh, airborne in infection devices in armed forces, in command hospital, in Ashwini, in Bangalore, and uh, elsewhere also. So let's clear the air. Let's see uh, this uh, airborne infection or infection is going to be there. Hospital acquired infection is going to be there uh, even beyond COVID. So this is an opportunity to pull up our socks and uh, make some arrangements uh, which are forever. So uh, WHO and CDC unfortunately took about a year to accept the fact that coronavirus also spreads or the main route of spread is through aerosols in the air. And what's the importance of the air? You can see from this uh, statistic that uh, we spend 90% of our time indoors and we inhale about 11,000 liters of air. Compare this with uh, three liters of water which we consume and two liter or two kgs of food we consume per day. So you can see how important uh, the air is. And uh, it's also proven that indoor air is five to 10 times more uh, infected or contaminated than outside air. So living with polluted air is like uh, a fish in a contaminated pot. So from where this uh, air pollution in indoor uh, environment comes from? It comes from building materials, population density, our actions and of course illnesses like tuberculosis and respiratory illnesses like COVID, lack of ventilation. We used a lot of cleaning chemicals, so they generate a lot of VOCs and chemicals. Uh, then we use a lot of personal care products, paint, carpet, furniture, and then we have pollen, fungal spores, mold, pet dandruff, and of course humidity. So uh, this is just an interesting uh, uh, slide that in a single minute of loud tucking, we could launch over thousand virus containing droplets. So this is just uh, interesting, uh, this thing. So all of us now, by now, learned that uh, airborne infection, how airborne inspections spray. So the larger droplets fall uh, up to one meter uh, from the individual. And then there are small infection droplets which go up to 1.5 meter. But then uh, there are infection droplet nuclei, which are very uh, light uh, in their uh, weight. And they travel up to 48 meter uh, in the air. And they can suspend, they can be suspended there forever, actually. In bit, uh, viruses, unfortunately, fall in this category. And that's how uh, uh, COVID has uh, raked the hub up uh, during the last one and a half year or so. And this the uh, right hand slide shows uh, the comparative sizes of all different uh, microorganisms or impurities vis a vis human hair. Uh, you can see SARS CoV 2 virus is so small, it's just uh, sitting uh, somewhere here. So whatever is uh, in the air, uh, in the air uh, settles on the surfaces and we touch the surfaces, our hands touch. So that is a infection control loop actually. So we need to uh, actually break this or close this infection control loop by taking care of airborne infection because everything which is there in the air uh, settles down on uh, surfaces. So what are the methods of uh, control of airborne infections? So there are broadly two methods. What is trapped? technology, another is deactivate or kill technology. Trap technology uses, uh, as you know, HEPA filters, uh, carbon filters, or ULPA filters, electrostatic precipitation filter. So it actually agglomerates or collects the impurities on the filter or some type of filter. And even ionizers uh, use uh, some sort of filters. Uh, uh, they're only labeled as plasma. And then uh, we have systems, uh, portable uh, purifiers, which combine all of these technologies of trapping uh, the pathogens. Then we have a deactivation or kill technology, which uh, mainly includes UVC, uh, that is that 254 nanometer, that's a medical grade UV frequency. Now we also have UVC 
uh, high UVC, that's 20 nanometer, which can be safely used uh, amongst the occupied spaces. Then we have pulse xenon. Then uh, chemicals, hydrogen peroxide, ozone, formaldehyde. These are all outdated and uh, uh, old technologies. And these technologies or these methods are uh, point in time. Yes, they are effective only when you do it. And once you open the doors and all these things, uh, the there is always a chance for. And uh, cold plasma nanostrike air sterilization, which I am going to talk about. So most of these air purifiers are uh, either positive or negative ion generators. And they're wrongly called as plasma. In fact, ionization is just a byproduct of plasma. It's not a plasma in itself. And they produce uh, uh, some harmful byproducts like ozone or hydroxyl radicals uh, in the human, human occupied rooms. So they are not advisable, advisable to be used uh, uh, with the patients or the occupied spaces actually. And as you know, HEPA filter, you have HVAC system, they are doing a wonderful job, but then they are very uh, difficult uh, to maintain. Uh, you need to change the HEPA filter, otherwise, uh, they become uh, colonized with the bacteria and uh, they become source of infection themselves. And as all the rooms are, uh, because it's a centralized uh, HEPA system or AHU system, all the rooms are connected. So if one room has uh, is having some infection, it may be transferred and amplified in all the rooms. And then uh, uh, Environmental Protection Agency, uh, they have labeled these devices, uh, all these portable devices, which you might have seen or you might be using at your home domestic user. They claim to be killing 99.99% of junk, but then they are tested in a like a small environment, a, a standard environment like a shoebox size in the lab. Uh, recently, New York State Department, uh, Education Department, they don't permit air purification using biopolar ionization or because of the side effects. And as you know, UV uh, is very effective in killing a microorganism, but then uh, it has its own side effects, like it is harmful for human skin and eyes, uh, if you get a direct exposure to that. Chemical fumigation, as you know, uh, cannot be used uh, in the human occupied rooms. They are also uh, detrimental for the uh, furniture and the equipment, uh, so you can't do it uh, in isolation. So all these ionizers, uh, they were rejected or rather they were called, recalled uh, recently from the schools uh, districts in uh, uh, USA because of uh, their side effects. So let's talk about uh, nano strike. Uh, the plasma based uh, solution may be first line of protection against airborne infections. So I will just share a small video, a uh, two minute video with you, and uh, I will I'll go into this. Okay. At the core of Novaris's air disinfection products Sorry. is one of the most powerful patented nanoscale technologies. Nanostrike is a lethal weapon in air disinfection and virus destruction. This unique plasma-based nanotechnology kills all airborne microorganisms by using coil tubes that are surrounded by an atmospheric plasma discharge. The discharge provides a deadly strike that kills and deactivates all harmful microorganisms, such as viruses, bacteria, and fungi as they pass through the plasma field. This patented technology harnesses multiple pathogen inactivation processes in one powerful strike. It destroys DNA and protein in a sub-second time frame. This stops viruses from spreading and bacterial and fungal spores from reproducing. Unique to nanostrike is its ability to attack the cell membrane, DNA and protein, causing osmotic pressure, which quickly bursts the pathogen cell providing no way for the cell to self-heal or develop antimicrobial resistance. Nanostrike's effectiveness lies within its ability to kill and deactivate even the smallest nano-sized pathogen on contact. As microorganisms pass through the nanostrike plasma field, they are rendered inert and deactivated. Therefore, only harmless dead pathogen debris emerges from the field. In contrast, Filters collect live pathogens, allowing them to breathe, creating, in effect, a new source of bio-burden. Also, some viruses and bacteria can potentially breach even the most efficient filter and can continuously release into the indoor environment. Novaris's nanostrike technology is the first law. Next slide. 
So plasma, as you know, is a post state of matter. Uh, the common example of plasma, uh, you can see the lightning uh, during the monsoon. So no wonder we feel fresh after uh, lightning. So it's purifies the air. So what happens uh, in this technology? Uh, everything happens inside the machine. As uh, unlike with other devices, they throw some ions uh, or some heteroxyl radicals in the air and they club with uh, the pathogens and they settle down on surfaces or some filters. But here, uh, the fan motor sucks in the air, goes around the plasma field, and within nanoseconds, uh, all this uh, uh, bombardment of electron charge particles, heat radiation, UV radiation, and then uh, electroporation, all, all these things happen simultaneously in a single strike. Uh, it appears as a single strike. And uh, finally, uh, it's the total destruction of airborne factor that happens with uh, osmotic pressure. So that's what uh, happens inside the device. There are three types of devices, three models. Uh, so uh, we have high-end model uh, 1050, which covers up to 1,000 plus square feet of area, which is in six plasma coils, high-speed fan motor, and also three stages of filters. Also, we have added HEPA filter, uh, pre-filter, activated carbon filter along with plasma. Even though it doesn't, it's not needed. Plasma itself is more than enough for uh, removing all those impurities. And we have a mid-level model, which can be used up to 400 square feet. Uh, these are all wall mounted or ceiling mounted, or it can be put on a desktop and a small personal model for about 100, 150 square feet room uh, with eight to 10 feet height. Uh, this is for personal use, small cabins or isolation rooms or patient bedside. Uh, so this is what uh, uh, three models. So uh, this is uh, how, uh, it's just a three stage procedure. There's a fan motor which takes in the air. There's a plasma coil. The air goes around plasma, directed by a discharge now. It's a patented technology. So it gets disintegrated or totally destructed then and there without any traces actually. So what comes out is only the pure uh, disinfected air. So this is the high-end model where uh, we have a postage filter along with the plasma coil. And uh, these are the images from NASA because this technology was validated by uh, NASA's Ames Research Center in Stanford. So they use uh, healthy E. coli bacteria and they uh, it was passed through this plasma field and within uh, say 20 milliseconds, you can see uh, this was totally destroyed. And they also use it for uh, Staphylococcus bacteria and also for uh, uh, fungal sore, Aspergillus. So uh, within seconds, uh, it, it was effective, uh, that's what. And then uh, not only that, we have tested this, independently tested this technology on actual live SARS-CoV-2 virus. We have tested it on influenza, measles, norovirus, and so far as tuberculosis, which is a big problem in India, and uh, which is a capital, India is a capital of tuberculosis, of course. So we have tested uh, this on tuberculosis also. You can see uh, in different type of rooms, different space of uh, uh, volume of room, uh, uh, it's effective up to 99.99% for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so all these things, even for mold spores, VOCs, and particulate matter. So all independent studies uh, and clinical uh, case studies have been done. So we are partnering with all these uh, big institutes uh, independently. Even in India, we have uh, done a lot of testing uh, uh, in TB uh, labs. So this is a finding from uh, SARS-CoV-2 live, live, live SARS-CoV-2 virus COVID-19. So uh, within 15 minutes with this uh, different 1050, the high-end model, within 15 minutes, uh, it was reduced to 99.99% and with the product 800 as mid-level small unit, uh, it took five hours to uh, reduce in that particular space. Of course, uh, we have done all the safety and compli compliance studies and we have approved. Uh, this is actually US FDA approved uh, class two device. It is CE approved. Uh, it has been approved uh, for ozone emission. Uh, so the ozone uh, and then also occupational safety and hazards institute has certified it. So it is well approved. And uh, recently we also registered this product as uh, the medical device with CDCSO uh, in India. So this is a very safe medical grade uh, product, uh, all these models. So in uh, nutshell, or uh, in short, uh, low virus direct dielectric barrier discharge, DVD plasma, how it is different from other technology. It's a third generation patented uh, plasma technology. Plasma, as you know, cold plasma is used for disinfecting uh, the medical devices, but then we are using air as a uh, plasma medium uh, to disinfect the air itself. So here, uh, the main difference is microorganisms are directly exposed to the plasma discharge inside the machine, as opposed to the byproducts of the discharge, like ionization. The inactivation in plasma occurs on the surface of the plasma coil. 
or near the surface as the air flows fully around the outer surface of the coil. So this innately destructive uh, uh, force plasma uh, kills microns uh, the discharge of electrons and ions. Uh, the best thing is it consumes very, very low electricity because the low uh, ultra low energy uh, cold plasma. It, happen, it happens at uh, room temperature and atmospheric pressure. So very uh, small energy is consumed. So uh, you know, uh, equivalent of a light burn actually. So you can use it 24 by 7 operation. So and you can use it around the vulnerable people in their breathing zone continuously without bothering of any electricity, big electricity consumption of power bills. And as I had showed you earlier, it's tested and proven, uh, and it's effective in more than 30 independent laboratory studies on different types of microorganisms. And uh, this is the only company, this, there are plasma uh, air sterilizers, big uh, room size plasma, and all this. But this is the only uh, device which is contained, which we are able to uh, control the plasma inside the device. Uh, so it can be used for days, wall mounted, or portable, and it's Windows application. And it has been installed in uh, different types, not just healthcare. Of course, healthcare is a prime focus area or prime. But uh, uh, during COVID times, we have uh, uh, installed it in schools and offices and uh, restaurants and pharmacy chains, uh, fire brigade offices and uh, RTPCR labs, uh, a chain of RTPCR labs and all the principal hospitals in Mumbai and COVID care hospitals of Maharashtra government. So this uh, machine has been uh, protecting uh, the frontline workers uh, during last one year. And we have to, uh, not just testimonials, but the detailed studies, uh, microorganism or air, air bacterial studies done by uh, many uh, clinics and many hospitals in India. So thank you very much uh, for this uh, uh, time and patiently listening. Uh, uh, please do visit our booth. We have a booth, uh, online booth. Uh, we have some uh, very interesting information there. At, I can share this presentation if somebody is interested, uh, interested, I can share it with IMR and we can have it. If you have any questions, uh, uh, we can have it uh, at the end of uh, this session if there is time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Dilip, for a very lucid presentation on a new technology, a nano stripe technology. Uh, I am sure participants will have questions. So while I wait for their questions to come on the question box or the chat box or the audio mechanism, uh, I will have a, I have a question for you. My question is, and uh, number one question is, what could be the deleterious effects of this technology? And number two, what is the approximate cost of installing this, uh, this type of technology in operation theater of size by 20 by 20 square feet for example. Now you are muted, can you, can you unmute yourself? So uh, to answer your first question, uh, what are the side effects? Uh, that's what uh, you mean to ask. So uh, it is too good to believe that this machine, uh, as everything happens inside that box, inside the machine. So whatever happens, whatever uh, plasma, uh, the destructive plasma does, this we are not allowing that plasma to come into the air. Rather, the air goes it goes to the plasma. So whatever happens around that two, two centimeter periphery of plasma coil. So uh, all the pathogens, whatever goes inside uh, with the help of a fan, uh, is totally destructed at the DNA or protein level uh, then and there. So it, it is converted into the base molecule actually. So it releases in the air as a neutral uh, this thing. So there is absolutely no. Uh, Harmful side effect. That's the beauty of this technology. So uh, means uh, that's why it is uh, approved uh, by US FDA as a class two medical device, and uh, it is uh, there's no ozone limit. Uh, this uh, whatever ozone is generated, it is in it is very minuscule, and then also inside the machine itself. So it's not spread to uh, the occupant. Actually. So it's the only technology which you can be used 24 by 7 in the breathing zone of the individual, the vulnerable patients, uh, without any side. Uh, and it's very silent. So you can't even, uh, in fact, uh, this new machine, uh, which is there, uh, you can see, and the small one, the box, two size box, is a small machine. Uh, it's, it's silent, it's on now, but uh, you can't even hear it. Uh, it has different fan speeds. The big unit is a floor standing unit, uh, uh, which has five speeds, uh, uh, which has a little bit of noise, but then that is as good as uh, air conditions noise, actually. But then you, have, uh, you can put it on, uh, on a, small speed uh, when uh, the patient is sleeping or at night, uh, but it still does the work. Uh, so 
we give three years of uh, uh, 26,000 years of uh, uninterrupted operation 24 by 7 uh, with this plasma thing. It's tested for 27,000 uh, of uh, hours, 20,000 hours. Uh, so it can be used uh, continuously without any problem. No maintenance better there. And then second question, price. Yeah, that is important question. Uh, so uh, different units cost different uh, this thing. Uh, you can use multiple units depending on uh, the volume and size of the room or type of uh, the patient uh, bio world actually. So, so what we have worked out or rather the price, the initial cost may be in lakhs. Uh, so this machine is about 5 lakh rupees and the small machine is about a couple of lakh rupees and the big machine is about 10 lakh rupees. But then the cost per day cost per patient, say for uh, 20 by 20 OT, uh, uh, or even for wards or uh, patient rooms, you are using it. So the per day cost, if you calculate for this uh, this type of uh, machine, which is uh, uh, adequate for about 400 square feet of room, uh, will be about a cost of a mineral water bottle per day. So this, uh, if you calculate maintenance cost, uh, the cost of ownership, uh, the electricity cost, uh, and all these things. So uh, for the uh, 20 patient, uh, this thing, uh, 20 patient uh, uh, ward, uh, uh, this machine uh, will be as expensive as one liter of mineral bottled water, maybe about uh, 30, 40 rupees per day per patient. Uh, that's what we have worked on. I can share that with you. But then, uh, as I told you, the initial cost seems uh, little higher as compared to the ionizers or the portable air purifiers which are available in the market. But this is a technology uh, which is uh, really uh, effective and proven technology so in the Indian context also. Okay. Thank you very much. I think that was a very elaborate answer. Thank you very much. We still have no questions on the question answer box. DGMS Army has not been able to connect with us because of some connectivity issue at his end. And moreover, he's also now tied up with some other uh, prior appointment of his. So he has uh, sent his regret. He will not be able to continue further. So that means that we have some time for question answer. If no question answers, uh, I would request the participants to share their views and their ideas on the subject. Because this is what uh, we all know that you know pandemics uh, may come and go but they may keep on recurring in nature so we have to be prepared for the future pandemic we should not uh, rest on the fact that we have been able to overcome this and we still do not know whether we overcome or not but even if we overcome something else might come up so we should be prepared for that now having said this if, uh, i would request my all the participants to ask some questions we have no questions then you want to share some experiences of yours, uh, please feel free to write a few lines and we will share it with everybody else. It is not a live session in the way that we all meet together and share our experiences outside the talks that have been given. So virtually also we can share our virtual experiences. So, um, so if you have five minutes. Yeah, please. Yeah, please. So one of please. the uh, one of the challenges which we faced uh, during the COVID hospital detailments at Patna and at uh, Delhi and Mujafarpur uh, was that when you're dealing with uh, civilians and when there is a, a particular casualty or a demise or something, uh, how do we handle the medical legal aspect of this when it comes in case they turn back upon us? What would be our role? What would be the role of the armed forces in such case? Um, does the humanitarian aid and disaster relief cover up these kind of uh, things? Because this at the ground level, most of us were unaware in case something happens, if there's a particular uh, named complaint or a, even an unnamed complaint against the organization, how is it handled? So that was one issue which probably needs to be ironed out before we go in for a future kind of a detailment. Yeah, I think uh, that is a very relevant question. And actually it happened. It happened with this... Uh your uh, hospital which we set up in Delhi and there was somebody from the very uh, senior person in the parliament whose uh, brother got um, some delayed, they, they felt they got delayed treatment in the hospital because there were a lot of people waiting and uh, he had already arranged for a bed but he could not get a critical care bed and he felt that his brother 
died because of not getting timely care. And he wanted to actually raise the issue. And he spoke to me because he and me were together uh, during long time back in 2004, 2005, he was at the under secretary level and uh, he was dealing with the standing stand, standing committee of parliament for defense when we were presenting our cases to the parliament committee. So he rang me up and he said, okay, sir, they have been very, very negligent and they have not been able to take care of my brother and I will need to file a case against them. Now remember, this is the time where soft skills come to the world. And we must train ourselves and our staff in soft skills. Which is, so I actually spoke to him for almost 45 minutes, reliving the scenario with him and making him become the medical officer in charge. And I say, see, what would you do under these circumstances when a critical care bed is not available? Am I going to remove somebody else's oxygen and give it to your brother? Now, my capacity is limited. So during that time when this was not happening, they did put him on Ambu bag. They gave him oxygen supply. He was not left very fit of oxygen supply. Only thing, they did this to tide over the crisis. You had brought him at a time and all cases admitted into hospitals are brought at a time when they are at a critical level. So you have to explain and after explaining, they understand. However, I also understand that people who are working there are fighting hard to save lives. They cannot start crying over dead lives. Because if you start explaining all this to one person, you might lose another life somewhere else. Right. So you have to say, we will discuss this out at present. I am busy. I am busy. I have got to save some other lives. We will try to uh, address your queries a bit later. And definitely your queries will be addressed. And if there is any negligence, you will accept the ownership. So you have to build in these skills, but still you will face this problem. And I can tell you very clearly, if somebody has put up that COVID was a classical, yeah, Shankar has put up. So yeah, Shankar, Kamara, Shankar, Subramaniam, welcome to this session. He has said it's a classical UCA situation, which means it is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. It is once in our life, lifetime that we get a chance to be in the middle of such a situation. So we need perspectives, perspectives both at conceptual and at execution level. So, okay, okay, she so is not related to this question. Uh, Shankar, I will address your issue. Yeah, so uh, we need yes. to be sure that we build in requisite soft skills in our staff from now onwards. That is one, to prevent occurrence of these activities. But whenever such a legal case comes, and we have not, uh, we'll have to provide evidence. Sorry. We are not able to provide evidence because the documentation is lacking. It will obviously be lacking in emergencies. So we have to find out ways and means to quickly document or have electronic media or documentation. Where somebody has documents and you subsequently have a signature to verify that this has been documented. So we have to now move forward to ensure okay. that we have evidences in place to combat such cases. But let me assure you, people do understand. It's the Im initial emotional outbreak during such epidemics that people become emotional, irrational. Over a period of time, rationality sets in and emotion gives way to reason. So I think uh, it starts out most of the times. I agree with you, sir. When, while, at, uh, while at Patna, uh, we were uh, called by the SDM and we were told that uh, whenever you have a, a death in the hospital, we made a special group, kindly put it on the group first and then inform the relatives. So we were wondering initially why on the group, you know, why should we declare it after a personal matter? Is this, Dr. Sahab, you don't understand it, you please do it. And for the first death which happened, we explained to the entire family and then we put, of course, put on the group. Within 15 minutes, there was a, a section of police which came there to, you know, uh, remove if any miscreants are there or something which happens. But uh, thankfully, sir, about uh, 150 odd patients in about four or five weeks, which we treated, uh, we lost about 18 to 20 of them. We spoke to all of them and their families. We did not have a single incident. And like you say, soft skills mattered a lot. Okay, I think I'll take on Shankar's uh, statement. And uh, he's very correct that uh, we are maybe, you know, it's a once in a lifetime 
and once that you get into middle of such a situation, I fully concur and agree with this. In such situation, definitely follow the VUCA principle. But we just need multiple perspectives, both conceptual and execution. Level. What you have seen today is a mix of both conceptual and execution. Level. We have seen today in the session that we have conceptualized the entire pandemic well and implemented and executed what we thought are the best way forward. We are still in the learning zone. Remember, medicine, and I am sure no better than Dr. Air Commodore Shankar to understand this. That medicine is an evolving, evolving science, and this evolution. Sir, yeah, hi. How are you? Good, sir. Nice to see you. Sir. You're looking smart in your. I think today is Friday, so Friday combat yeah. Air Force uniform. You're looking smart in it. Sir, thank you, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, will you please share your perspective? I don't want to share only my perspective. You share your no, perspective. Just, uh, yeah, I was looking at it from the point of view of a, a complexity theory, and the the COVID was a classical what we call as a VUCA situation. That is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And uh, the whenever we are thrown in a VUCA situation, the war is a classical VUCA situation, and possibly one of Though there are, I agree with you, there are multiple perspectives, but one of the best perspectives which works is what was by John Boyd, who was an ace uh, fighter pilot of the World War, and he possibly had the maximum number of kills, I mean, among the German, German airplanes, and he used to follow something known as the OODA loop, which is observe, orient, decide, act. So whether we are at a level of a policy making, whether we are at the level of a research, whether we are at an execution of a uh, you know, like uh, the challenges which Tilak has thrown up at the actual execution level. The beauty is that the VUCA is persistent across all levels, and the UDA loop actually is a fantastic model to keep in the head. So I just thought, okay, you know, it's just a, it's a good idea to share an overview of a, this thing rather than getting into the, this thing, you know, the VUCA and UDA loop. That's all. Thank you. Thank, thanks. 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 Very well. Very well. Very well. General, I have two questions. Yeah. One of the questions I posed in the beginning uh, uh, was that key, what about those cases which were undiagnosed and continue to have long term effects? I'm talking about the serving soldiers, sailors, airmen. And the second question is that what are our strategies towards places where people report in hundreds for training? Are we waiting for 14 days to pass before we can utilize them for training or have we switched now? to a strategy of fourth or the fifth day, and you do bulk testing. Now, bulk testing, et cetera, these are not as per the um, ICMR guidelines or whatever might be the case, but being in defense forces and each day of training being at a premium, we need to have our own strategies. So I would just like to know, and maybe the audience also, uh, as to how do we tackle these two issues? I think both questions are very, very relevant. We'll come to, we were in the process of answering the first one and we started the session all over again. And that is how to look after those undiagnosed patients who subsequently landed up with a complication, which could have been possibly due to the earlier COVID infection that they got. And there are a lot of complications that we, we all understand. There are musculoskeletal complications, there are cardiovascular complications, there are neuro, uh, there are neurological oriented, oriented complications. And uh, one thing I will say that uh, most of these complications that occur could possibly occur in 95% of the cases who have had a moderate to moderately severe attack of COVID, which means he would have come, he or she would have come to the healthcare sector and would have been diagnosed either clinically or by uh, investigations that he suffered from COVID. But there will be a small proportion of cases would be undiagnosed and you are referring to these undiagnosed cases where it may be difficult to work out the causality, whether COVID-19 was the cause of the current situation or irrespective, the treatment modalities for the complication remains the same. So they will be subjected to same type of treatment modalities first discovered, then he'll be investigated to see what could have been the possible cause of this particular ailment, could it be related to COVID? Could it not be related to COVID? If the answer is yes, then whatever protocols are there for post-COVID uh, complications that will be carried out. If answer is no, that it is unlikely to be related to COVID, then alternative causes will have to be found out. 
So there we set protocols which we actually follow in real life situation that what is attributable and what is not attributable and what is aggravated and what is not aggravated. These protocols have already been made by the additional director general of information, medical and health services at the level of the uh, DGMS army and the director of health at the level of the DGFMS. So with based upon these protocols, these individuals will be assessed and appropriate treatment and appropriate rehabilitation and appropriate attributability and aggravation will be granted to such individuals. That is one. Coming to the strategies for training, you ask a very tough question here. We have certain ICMR guidelines which very clearly says that you have to quarantine people, but who is to be quarantined? Now, quarantine is for close contacts, Quarantine is those who have a history of a contact with a patient. The quarantine for those people who are asymptomatic, who could be effect, infected, but we have no chance of understanding whether they are infected or not. Quarantine is not for diagnosed cases or suspicious cases. Quarantine is for contact cases. So if we do not have history of contact, if the people who report to a training center do not have history of contact, they are therefore, as per the law of the land, they are supposed to be, you know, taken care of in that manner. You can have four days, five days based upon our requirements, not on what the ICMR says. But if there is a history of contact, then you are quarantined. And under such circumstances, we in the defense services know whether our people have history of contact or not. Because we are fairly honest in our reporting. So if there is no history of contact, we can have that five days period where the people are supposed to show the symptoms. We expect that the median period, incubation period, when a person can show the symptom is five days, we can keep them for five days and people are asymptomatic, we can start the training for them. But that is our way of looking at it, which has to be verified, certified, based upon certain parameters and checklists, which are to be done in the conjunction with the medical authorities. So this should be the plan of action to make a strategy. If somebody has history of contact, that person has to be quarantined for 14 days. We cannot help. Actually, they all travel. Uh, I'm talking about soldiers. Yeah. They travel by bus. They travel by train. And he wouldn't have okay. no idea whether he has had contact with somebody or not. So therefore, we have to work on the premise that possibly they would have had some contact. Now, we are aware that even after two shots, people are, um, you know, they are COVID positive. We had a training establishment recently within the army where about 70, 80, 100 of them were found, but they were asymptomatic, but they were going through life, but they were carrying the virus. It's as recent as a month back. So what I'm trying to say is that we need to have an effective approach, um, uh, an approach uh, which suits our requirements so that we don't lose training days. Yeah. I think one of the approach we had done in operatum to see during operatum, we had carried out the approach of identifying our forces which are vital, essential, and desirable. And based upon this VD analysis, we start in each course what is vital, which has to be learned by all trainees of that level, what is essential, which can be learned, and what is desirable, which can be learned on the job as you proceed on. So the desirable component of the course was deleted. The vital component was given the best time and the essential component was covered in an in essential way. So you can... I have been the commandant of a training academy. We have done all of that and uh, it's not possible to compromise. You see, there are uh, things to be done. So why don't we inject testing strategies? Why are we wanting the training people to compromise the way they, they have to do business? Because at the, at the end of the day, anyway, this is one area I personally feel having faced it uh, uh, myself, it needs a clear line of approach. Yeah. Away from the system for the last. Addressed, it needs to be addressed at the holistic level with all the stakeholders coming together and making a policy on this. But at the same point of time, we must also understand that the uh, health aspects should take priority and that health aspect take priority based upon policy that we make. So whatever policy we make should be in sync with the available 
evidence based so we have to follow the evidences and i fully agree with you at present in this pandemic we do not have sufficient evidence to say what is right and what is wrong we all work on a hunch and over a period of time we found out this is going to be true with all the pandemics and all the epidemics that is going to happen in the future also so i think uh, we need to sit together yeah but why i'm saying so is because it is related to our capacities what happens is that you you can't uh, spend money uh, in sending those cases if you decide to do bulk testing to save time uh, then you have to either spend money to do it done privately because if you send it to any government establishment which has the kits they will say look we don't cater for such like stuff and if you don't have your own machines like truenet or whatever uh then you won't have your integral capacity to do it yourself you can get the kits so there are issues um now that we have gone through this i think institutionally we should prepare ourselves yeah. yes and you know i'll just give the example of what we had done during op parakram because most of our courses were slashed by our track and i was the training officer in ac center in college and we used to indulge in combat training of all the young doctors who come to us so what we did we did exactly what is all the desirable and essential portion of the course material we sent it to them to do on their own and then when they came forward to us we focused on the vital because our we were told you have to do it in this much time in this cases we can use the current technology to do some uh, theoretical training but practical training has to be on ground trust me compromise we have, trust me we have gone to the level of uh cabin pt is supervised in camera so it's not that key all these things have not been explored uh, uh, anyway uh, i think it's, it's a topic for discussion yeah. it's a topic for discussion it's a good question yeah okay i think we can I thank some, yeah is there, is there some questions okay all right i think there are no questions sir so i'll hand over the this thing thank you to you back to you and thank you very much general singhil for a you know, wonderful session and for giving me this opportunity and privilege to chair this session it was uh, also very nice interacting with you on some very controversial subjects which need to be taken up and discussed at a higher level for everybody to come together and come to some common solutions thank you very much for this opportunity and thank you general ravi arora for having me yet once again on such a forum i really love this session and i thank the dgms army general dalji singh i thank uh, our group uh, captain tilak i thank mr dilip patel for the lovely presentation that they gave unfortunately we could not hear the full context of what uh, general dalji had to say but i'm sure uh, his uh, powerpoint will be uploaded for us to see at a later point of time and i thank uh, air commodore shankar subramanian for uh, his comments and thank you sir thank you all of you and thank you dear participants for tolerating us for this maturation thanks a lot and jain thank you uh, thank you jainal kapoor and uh, jainal uh, a marshal uh, kapoor and uh, jainal daljeet and of course the distinguished, distinguished speakers and panelists uh, uh, i i close uh, with a resounding acknowledgement of everything that the healthcare and medical fraternity in uniform has done during these very challenging times and is continuing to do so Thank you so much. Best wishes.